audio. <laughs> Just uh, want you to be able to see the screen at the same time. Is that possible? Yep. Okay, we'll just open in prayer. Thank you, Father God, that we can enjoy your wonderful presence here tonight. We thank you for being amazing. We bless you, Lord Jesus, and we, we thank you for um, your word, your power, your life, uh, your direction through your word. And Father, we thank you that um, you want to reveal who you are through the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for through your word as well. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, not all that long ago, we were watching this movie and uh, it's um, it basically it's about the woman in gold or the lady in gold. I don't know if anybody's seen that movie, but uh, we're going to show a short preview of it. But um, tonight's message is all about God's will and testament. So I'm just going to uh, do the old clicky thing. Your son, the lawyer, how is he? Some letters I found in my sister's belongings. I need advice from someone I can trust. Can't you just help me on the side? There is no on the side. There's a full-time job. Oh, how can you see out of those glasses? Filthy. Here she is, my aunt, Adela, painted by Gustav Klimt. That's quite a painting. She was taken off the walls of our home by the Nazis. And since then, she's been hanging in the Belvedere Gallery in Vienna. And now you'd like to be reunited. Wouldn't that be lovely? And then there's justice. You really think the painting that ends up as a fridge magnet will ever leave Austria? It'd be a mistake not to take a look. Could you drive a little faster? We're going to be there four hours early. But I want to buy perfume and cognac in duty free. I never thought I'd come back. That's our home on my wedding night. Half of Vienna was here. Mrs. Oldman, welcome to Vienna. They're going to put as many obstacles in your way as possible. We were going to try and find a copy of your aunt's will. I could have searched for the file on my own, you know. Well, I wasn't going to miss all the fun. This is like a James Bond film, and you're Sean Connery. The painting belongs to Mrs. Oldman's family. She is the Mona Lisa of Austria. We will fight you till the end for something we believe is ours. They destroyed my family. They killed my friends, and they forced me to abandon the people and the places that I loved. I won't let them humiliate me again. Here to file a lawsuit. We're taking the Austrian government to court. Have a nice day. There's no way you're gonna win. We didn't come here to eat cake. All along, you have thwarted me and closed the doors in my face. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a moment in history. Once the past, has been put to right. We will not have come here in vain. People see a masterpiece by one of Austria's finest artists. But I see a picture of my aunt, a woman who used to talk to me about life. We should be reunited with what is rightfully ours. Andy, can't you drive a little faster? Look, the chocolate on your donut is melting. Right, so has anybody actually seen that movie? No, I would recommend it, but I'm going to ruin it too because I'm going to tell you the end of the story. <laughs> so, but that's all right. Um, it's still very worthwhile we're, um, seeing it. So effectively what's happened is that um, when the Nazis came to Austria, they uh, caused some of the Jews to want to flee the country. And so this particular artist had been put in a position where he um, was a Jewish banker as well as um, um, did uh, salt salt mining and so he commissioned this painting and uh, so as he fled the uh, the Nazis accused him of tax evasion and said we need some of your possessions to, to take on board the uh, so-called loss of income or taxes and so they used his property which turned out to be around five different um, paintings that uh, in the end turned out to be that one alone when it did get, eventually get sold, collected $135 million. So there was a fair reason to fight for that painting. And the, the thing was that that painting was never actually meant to leave their family. And so what had transpired is that now the, uh, the art gallery now has been given this painting and other ones as well. 
and it's become the most popular painting uh, in, in that, uh, in that um, gallery. So it was virtually Austria's uh, Mona Lisa, as they, they were saying. So you can see that there was a lot of history captured there. There was a lot of money that was captured, um, and nobody wanted to let go. All right? So there's a lot of, lot of uh, things in play. So what's actually transpired is that the, um, this lady thought, well, as she's getting older, she found that photo of, her, of that uh, painting that belonged to her because she was in a will. Right? Because the people had died, and so she was entitled to that painting. So now she wants to go get the painting, and so she uh, employs her rookie nephew, who just happens to be a, a very green lawyer, and they go on a, a hunt for this painting to get it back from the Austrian government. So it takes seven years to complete the conclusion. Right? And they actually had to take the Austrian government to court. So none of these things are light in themselves. In fact, two-thirds of the way through the movie, this lady, the older one that wants to go get her duty free, because <laughs> she hadn't been back to Austria in all, all those years since she left from the war. And so she ends up in a position where she says, no, you know what? It's too hard. I'm giving up. Forget it. But now the other young fellow has said, well, I've had to give up everything. I'm giving up my family life. I'm giving up my, new, my ch newborn children. They're suffering because I'm doing this project for you. And now you want to quit? Now he's got the determination and he's after it himself now to, to uh, get what's rightfully the families. So that's the interesting part about it is that it all hinged on one major point was that she was actually in a legal binding will. Without that one classification... She could have tried even way beyond what she did and there's nothing that would have stood together and given her opportunity to, to get that, that painting because if she wasn't in that will, it was history. It all hinged on that. And then finally the verdict came when they're all, all looking at it as a hierarchy of, of this uh, judicial system. Uh, eventually they had to weigh in and say, right, is this legally right? Or is it legally not right? And she won the case simply because of that will. Because she was deemed to be part of that family and deemed to be in order of receiving it. So here I was watching the movie and I'm thinking, my goodness, you know, like, there's a lot of things in this that like, relate to our Christian life. Right? There's a lot of things here that God's put into place for us and that um, you know, we, we uh, you know, sometimes uh, at church we hear about God's will and you know, what is his will and what's going on there and all sorts of things like this. So the thing is that um, he's got a written will. Did you realise that? God has a written will. <laughs> now, it might sound funny that I say it in, in that way because we hear, we hear a lot of times where it will be uh, uh, people will say, what is God's will, what's happening, all this sort of stuff. But he actually has a written will. Does anybody here have their own written will? I do. <laughs> John, I see about three people up the back. I see four. Aha. Uh -huh. So if anything happens to you guys, who can make a claim on your estate? The government. <laughs> so that's... They can have your debts. <laughs> so we've all got some of them, I reckon. So what happens is that if you don't have a legal binding will, then, then everything just effectively is put into chaos. Right? But the, uh, the reality of it is that um, you know, God himself wants us to, uh, to actually know some things about what his purpose and his will is. So the thing is that... Um, he came and, and uh, managed to uh, change things around a little bit. What we find is that, as we, we're probably quite comfortable knowing that there's an old covenant, an old testament, right, in, in our Bible. But then, of course, we, we get the next section where in the middle, well, not quite the middle, two-thirds of the way in, there's a gap between the new and the old 
and it says here that, I don't know if it's, uh, you've paid a lot of attention to this page. It says it's a, the New Testament. So what does the word testament actually mean? It means will. What is the will of God? So here he's written his will, and I'm not sure about your Bible, but mine has about 250 pages of his will. Has anybody been an executor of a will? So if you haven't, you've then got to distribute all those things that the family members, or if you have a will, you've got to nominate somebody that's going to say, uh, yes, you get this, you get that, this is how the accounts are found out, you've got to divide it, you've got to pay bills. So there's a lot of intensity in being an executor of a will. But to be on the receiving end of something in a will, what's the main criteria? You have to be in it, don't you? You have to be in it to win it. Right? If you're not in the will, you completely miss out. Is that fair enough? You miss out. Sorry about that. But you do. So what happens is that we end up um, needing to be in the will. So how do we know in God's whole purpose, his whole plan, his will, how do we know that we're, that we're in his will? How would we know that we're actually in the will of God? His legal, written, binding will. There's a particular passage I'm looking for. <laughs> it's in Revelation, if I can give you a hint. No. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. Anybody heard of that one? Uh huh. So it's in there. <laughs> so what it actually means is that what happens is that um, when we say yes to Jesus, we actually are written in his book. So there's a big book in heaven that has your name in it. So as soon as you say yes to Jesus, done deal, you're in the book. So in other words, you're in his will, you're in his, in his plan. You're always in his plan, but now you get to inherit right into the kingdom of God. So I'm probably jumping around slightly, but let's see what the next uh, slide offers. Now that's, the, uh, that's again a bit more of a close view of the painting, which is um, awesome. So here's Revelation 3, 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments and I will not blot out his name or her name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. There we go. So if you're written in the Lamb's book of life, all good. So there's another criteria that happens that if you have a will, how does it come into place? What has to happen for a will to come into, into action? Somebody has to die. My goodness, it's a pretty morbid sort of thing, isn't it? But uh, the thing is that when, when you've got a legal binding piece of agreement, somebody has to have died for that will to come into place. So otherwise you can't make a claim on the estate, right? And you're not going to anyway. But the reality of it is, we have, we have like we've been talking about before, we have a written will, so we have the opportunity to do that ourselves. Has God got a written will? a legal binding agreement. Has he got one of those in place? Yes, he does. So for him to have a legal binding will in place, what's the second part of the equation? We know, you, first off, you've got to have a will. Secondly, to make it happen or to come into force, somebody has to die. So who died? Aha. Uh -huh. So Jesus has died... So now what's actually happening is that that will and purpose of God is now in play, isn't it? So to speak. So what's happened in the past is that we have the old covenant, the old way of doing things, which we were never able to be a part of unless you wanted to be what they call a proselyte, which is a, somebody that wants to become a Jew, and you would have to go through all the ceremony and you were never allowed in the temple anyway. So you would still be counted as a, an outer. You weren't allowed to worship like everybody else did. So even if you managed to get to that point that you wanted to be under the old covenant back in the day, 
before Christ, that's the way you would have had to do it. You would have had to virtually become a Jew. So that really doesn't do too much for us, I don't suppose. <laughs> we don't have that opportunity. So now what needs to happen is that we have to, we have to uh, step into a new covenant. And that's why this page between the two books is pretty important because something's transpired between this section of, the, of God's word to this section of God's word. The Father has paid and, and sent a huge, um, paid a huge price, just like they had a massive ordeal to get back what was rightfully theirs. The Father was doing the exact same thing on our behalf because he was putting in amazing things in place with Christ coming to earth to get back what he originally owned. And that's us. He was not happy for us to continue on into a life of oblivion and an eternity without him. That was a no-go option. So he turned to Jesus and said, Son, we've got a plan. Let's go redeem mankind. Let's go from the old way of doing things to create something fresh and brand new that encompasses everybody Everybody can say yes to Jesus and everybody can come into the kingdom of God. Everybody can be in my will and my plan. So here it is here. For this reason, he is the mediator, which is Jesus himself and our negotiator, of a new covenant. That is an entirely new agreement uniting God and man so that those who have been called by God may receive the fulfilment of the promise of eternal inheritance. Since, the, since a death has taken place as the payment which redeems them from the sins committed under the absolute, oh sorry, obsolete first covenant. So it has redeems them from the sins committed under the obsolete first covenant. Very critical. Because a lot of times we will try and bring forward some of the old covenant ways of living, ways of being, some of our, the way that we uh, uh, think about things about God uh, needs to change because the old covenant is completely different and now obsolete to the new covenant. Um, we were listening to a testimony on the radio this morning and it was all about, um, I didn't hear the whole one but Nadia did, in that this woman had been brought up into a cult and uh, the uh, father was a dictator, right? Really staunch and boom, you know, he was a religious dictator. And, um, and so this young lady anticipated that God himself was of the same mold, same character as, as her father. So she actually feared God, thought he was a big ogre sitting on a throne with a big mallet effectively, looking for any way that he could squash you know, you're into the ground, effectively, right? Because that was her concept of how God, at her time, was. And a lot of that's portrayed a little bit through the old covenant style of things. We see judgment coming upon man and all sorts of things like this and upon people that were, um, you know, opposing uh, Moses and so forth, where the earth opened up and got swallowed into the ground. So there's a lot of old covenant things that we may think and try to bring forward but Christ Jesus is the mediator and he stands between God the Father and us. And he allows us to have free uh, frequency into the presence of God because we've said yes to Jesus. We are no longer in that way. That's why I'm pointing out critically the first, uh, first covenant is obsolete. Obsolete. So be careful with some of our thinking that we don't bring forward some of the obsolete ways that God... Um, um, was dealing with mankind in the original times. So now that we have an inheritance, how do we make a claim um, on the bank of heaven? Because the Lord's Prayer says that his will be done on earth the same as it is in heaven. So how do we make a claim? If we've actually got an inheritance, we have a will, the God's will, we're part of this will, it's been fulfilled. Jesus has died. He's risen again, fortunately. So how do we make a claim on that? So just like in the movie, and this is so amazing, is that 
just like they had an advocate, they had somebody that was fighting on the behalf of them, of the, uh, the older lady. Jesus is fighting on our behalf. But at the same time, what's happening as well is there was somebody stealing the property or had actually stolen it. Is there a very similar scenario in Scripture that we see like that? A hint to Scripture would be John 10.10. 10. And some, some that might know me would know the Scripture pretty well. So anybody can quote that one? Correct. So here's the thing, right? We have the purpose and will of God. We have a phenomenal amount of benefits that we can claim on. Right? We have an evil one trying to separate us from the love of God, but trying to separate us from all of his wonderful benefits. Now, oftentimes we, we hear the comment, well, I'm just looking forward to the day I get to heaven because I'm going to enjoy the whole panorama of God and all those things that he has for us. But what happens if, when you've said yes to Jesus, that heaven actually is residing now in you and you carry heaven with you? So today's the day of salvation, the scripture says. So today's the day we're supposed to be enjoying it all. Today's the day we're supposed to see all of his benefits uh, coming across the table, so to speak. All right. So we have, an, we have somebody that wants to steal, kill and destroy but Jesus said that he wants to get us, get us to a place where we can actually um, stand strong in our faith, stand strong against that evil one, stand strong against the one that's trying to deteriorate our life and, uh, and make God's purpose real in us. We've, um, uh, one of the scriptures relates to we have to fight the good fight of faith. The evil one does not want you having what you're rightfully entitled to. Just like in this movie... That gallery did not want to lose their prized possession. And the evil one doesn't want you to, to have your prized possessions that God's provided. So here's the other... Um, this is written that you may know. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, which represents all that Jesus Christ is and does, so that you will know with settled in absolute knowledge that you already have eternal life. This is the remarkable degree of confidence which he, as believers, are entitled to, having before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, that is constant with this plan and purpose, he hears us. And if we know for a fact, as indeed we do, that he hears and listens to us in whatever we ask, we also know with settled and absolute knowledge that we... Have granted, he has granted to us the requests which we have asked from him. So that's in 1 John 5, 14. So the thing is, there's some pretty big, pretty big claims in Scripture about all the amazing things we're allowed to participate in and have. But how do we go about making that claim? So first off, we've read in this Scripture that we need to make our requests known, don't we, to God. Right? So we have to say something to him. We have to step into his presence and say, Father, here I am. I'm coming in your presence. I have a couple of things I need sorted out. So I would say most of us have something on a daily basis that has to be sorted out. All right? That's how life is. All right? So as we come into God's presence, we make our requests known to him. But oftentimes we throw a little bit of doubt in there as well when we ask. The scripture actually states not to doubt, not to have unbelief. Because really, as I've said before, unbelief is actually just the fact that you don't actually believe God is capable of answering what you're asking for. And we know that if it's to do with his will, then that prayer is going to get answered. But here's the key to it as well. A lot of times people have no clue or very little clue as to understanding what is truly the will of God. So just like when you've got a normal natural will, you can read the, read the piece of paper and go, aha, this is their estate, this is what I'm entitled to, you beauty, right? But the fact is that I would say that, and they've done st studies and surveys, um, if we don't know God's will, it's more than life because we haven't read these many pages. So if we don't know what's in the book, if we don't know what's in this legal binding agreement, 
we can't really make a confident claim as to what's truly ours. And that's why we have a lot of confidence when we pray is because we've read the book. We've found the answers. We've found what God actually wants to do. All right? He wants to bless. He wants to encourage. He wants to set the captive free. Jesus came to, to give us rights and opportunities in the kingdom of God. In fact, he, uh, in a minute we'll discuss even about how that those rights don't just encompass us, they also encompass others that, that we engage with. That he, As we bump into people in real life, that he wants us to, uh, to also show them the kingdom of God and how to participate in those same benefits that he has created for us. So when we're making a request, we obviously need to pray. We also need to have hope that our request you know, is being heard. Fair enough, isn't it? You don't want to just be saying something and throwing something out there and go, is God really listening? You know, hello, anybody there type thing? Well, he promises he does, he hears us. The amazing part about that scripture as well is that if you ever want to go back into the original language that's written in, that word, when he says that he... Um, um, if we ask anything according to his will, consistent with his plan and purpose that he hears us, that actual word he is there is, is a, a legal term of bringing it, that, that request to a court proceeding. So God's actually allowing you to present your request and he's taking on the request and then taking that to the Father on your behalf. So it's very, very powerful, very, very powerful. So if we understand what the scripture's all about and how we pray and how we can pray, then when we actually take that prayer with confidence and faith and hope and belief, then that gives us the opportunity to receive the answer for that. Because if you doubt or um, circumvent it with, with unbelief, then it's very hard for him to get to you what you're asking for. All right? So with a will, there's something else that has to happen. I've mentioned it slightly. So... You actually need somebody to be an executor of the will, don't you? Somebody has to stand there and work through all the paperwork and go, you know what, this has got to go here, this has got to go there. So if God's got a legal binding will, who's the executor of his will? Uh huh. Any more thoughts? Aha, uh -huh. that's uh, the main one I was looking for. Sorry, Loggy. <laughs> Actually, you're both right. That's the truth of it. Um, the fact of it is right is that as an executor, God's, God's word is actually settled in heaven. That should be the next one. In Psalm 119.69, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven standing firm and unchangeable. So he's, his word's already done. It's already fulfilled. It's fulfilled. So here you have the word of God that's fulfilled in heaven. So God doesn't actually have to do any more with his word. He's already fulfilled it. All right? He's already accomplished everything it needs to do in regards to Christ, bringing it into play for us to, to accept and, and uh, to participate in. So an executor of the will is the one that dishes it all out, isn't it? Makes it all happen. So on this earth, how does God get his will to be done in, in people's lives? Or how does he see, how do we see his manifestation of the Spirit of God or his power, his life, his capacity to come in into people's lives in a, in a powerful way or in any way? Like Luke said, somebody has to pray, somebody has to do something for God to be able to do something. All right? I'm sure there's a number of aspects outside of that, but majority of the kingdom of God's activity is all about us doing something in his name. So there was a situation in Scripture in uh, Jesus was in a boat. All right? Don't mind that. Don't mind being in a boat from time to time. So Jesus is in the boat, and here's this storm and he's asleep. So what happens next? Anybody can fill me in? 
What did the disciples do? <laughs> yeah. And then what did they do? They woke him up. Seems fair, really. Right? Seems fair. Like they're about to sink. Professional fishermen are about to sink. So that gives an illustration that it could be a fairly reasonable storm. If the, if the, if the big boys know, don't know how to swim and they're about to drown and they're fishermen, all right, they're in trouble, really. And they wake Jesus up, but what does Jesus say to them? Yeah, why don't you do something about it yourself? Why did you wake me up? <laughs> right? It's not the message you probably wanted to hear after you're just about to die. And Jesus comes along and tells you off for, for waking him up. Oh, Lord, what are you doing? Well, it was more like he was asking that question to the disciples. Well, what are you doing? And that's when Jesus also encouraged them to talk about the fact that you've got to speak to your mountain. You've got to bring it into force yourself in prayer. Right? And that's really all prayer is, is believing God can change the facts. But unless you pray, unless you agree with heaven, unless you get God and communicate with him, there's a lot of things that are not going to happen on this earth, in your realm, in your family's realm, in all these areas, they're not going to happen unless you pray. If you don't say anything about it, if you don't, Scripture says you, you have not because you ask not. All right? So if you've got turmoil and all sorts of junk happening in your family and all sorts of things that are going wrong because the evil one's killing, stealing, destroying your life in your family and wherever it happens to be, then it's us as God's police person that says you have to stop in Jesus' name. It's us that are able to command peace and to speak to that storm in people's lives, in our lives, and say, stop in Jesus' name. So sometimes that could be a new concept for us. right? Because we might be used to the throwaway prayer, oh God, please help me. But what, happen, what happens if he's turning around saying, but I've already showed you how to help yourself. I need you to pray so that I can step up on your behalf Without you asking, I can't break, I can't just come in and override everything. I need you to be involved, to be engaged. And that's why it's so critical to understand you know, what we're inheriting. And that's why Jesus also said to us as well that with the, the power of the Holy Spirit, we're un united with God. So it's, the, it's us and the Holy Spirit. It's not, not just us going around and think we're wonderful and yeah, let's do this, let's do that, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Because if you don't have the faith and belief for it, then like, like the sons of Zebedee that um, was it the, uh, uh, tried to cast out a demonic force and, uh, in Jesus' day, and, and the, this person that had all these dom uh, demons in him over, overtook all of them and thrashed them and they all come running out naked. Because they, weren't, they were saying, but in Jesus' name. But they weren't, they weren't one of the disciples. They weren't in God's kingdom, like we all are. So they were trying to do something in, from God's kingdom, and they weren't in the kingdom. So the scripture also says that, um, that it's, it's our hands. Lay hands upon the sick, the scripture says. Jesus says that we are his body on earth. We are his hands. We are his feet. So if we're his hands and we're his feet, then I guess he expects us to do something about it. All right. So he gives us the capacity and the, he wants us to be engaged and involved in that as well. So what, what are some of the things that are in, in our inheritance? Who can think of some? What can you expect as an inheritance now before we pass away, before we step into the next world? What can we expect as our inheritance today? Any clues? What are you inheriting from Jesus now that the world doesn't have? Peace. Peace. Yep. Love. Self-control. Self <laughs> Fruits of the Spirit. Uh-huh. So these are critical. This is what you're entitled to right now. This is in your inheritance right now because remember... Jesus has died. It's all, all up for grabs. It's all up for grabs. It's all yours. What else is our entitlements? Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Yes? Can I hear something up the back there? <laughs> it's very quiet back there. So some of the thoughts I've also had um, is that also we have the mind of Christ. Can't have that if you're a non-Christian. Um, a victory over sin. We have forgiveness, so we have a clean conscience. All right, so we get to live a peaceful life in that regard. Sonship, so we're in the kingdom of God. We're, we're uh, heirs, of the, heirs of Christ with Christ in heavenly places, as John said. Um, we're allowed in God's presence. That's huge in its own self. And the old covenant, there was one person per year. And uh, if they mucked up through that whole year, when they went into the presence of God, they had a rope tied around their leg. Right, this will test you if you think you've been a good boy for all the whole year. You step into God's presence to find out if he's really happy with you or not. And if they drag you out, guess what? It wasn't a good year. Right? But we actually get to run into the presence of God and say, Abba, Father, Daddy, any time we wish. They couldn't do that under the old covenant. Not possible. So that's huge in that self. So we're seated in Christ, which I heard. So um, uh, he gives us mercy. We actually have the love of, of God. The amazing part as well is we actually have his Holy Spirit. Um, we can obviously pray for healings and miracles, answers to prayer, and eternal life. So it's pretty amazing, pretty amazing. So um, I guess really what we'll do is I want to, I want to encourage you that, that there's a lot available in God's word, God's kingdom, God's power, God's presence. He's an amazing, amazing God. And it's just that we just got to get involved in, in that kingdom of God. So he wants us to engage on a daily basis with other people, lay hands on the sick, see amazing things happen. But if we don't believe that it's capable, he's capable of it or we're capable of it through him, it's never going to happen. You know, it's never going to happen. There will be multiple times when God wants to lead and guide us and direct us. And if we're not listening or we're not participating or just on our mission only there's going to be a huge amount of benefits in the kingdom of God we're not engaging in. A lot of stuff that we can enjoy and be a part of. So effectively what I'm saying now is it's time to read God's word, read his will, know his instructions. Um, so from here, let's participate in kingdom activity every day. Amen.